All right. Um, yeah, hi, I'm Thomas Gregor. I'm from Princeton. Um, I am thankful for being able to present at this conference. I'm giving you two lectures. Um, and um, give you just a little bit of my background, because I guess it's good to know where I'm coming from. So uh, if I use strange language, you uh, can interrupt me. Like physics language or biologist, that's not good, or vice versa. And interrupt, I felt like the other lectures, you, you can just, you, you should interrupt me much more than what you did in the other lectures, because I'm much less clear than Frank or CP. So be, uh, be ready for a messy lecture. So um, <clears throat> I am, I've come from a physics background. I uh, started as a theorist. And um, during my PhD, I realized that, and I was always interested in, in biology, but I used to do quantum physics. And during my PhD, I realized that, yes, the biology is really what I wanted to do, and quantum physics got a little bit boring. And, um, when I, and at first, it was natural to switch to a theory lab. And um, what I realized, though, is that in, if you do theory in biology, um, you, it's very nice to come up with very complicated models. But what's really lacking in biology compared to physics uh, are very good measurements. Because if you want to have a good model that has any predictive power or has anything to contribute, I think it's very important that um, you, uh, at some point, are able to go beyond the phenomenological uh, description and really try to predict something that, has, uh, that can be measured, that has error bars, and where your model really helps you to refine you know, uh, your exploration of, of that political phenomenon. And so um, that's what I engaged in. I, my PhD was in between then physics uh, theory and uh, experiment. And now in my lab, I still kind of do the same. Although, because it's much harder to do good experiments in biology, physics style experiments, we are doing mostly experiments. And for the theory, we often actually collaborate with um, theorists that are in-house or, or also across the world. And so um, <clears throat> I'll give you, in the two lectures that I have, a little tour um, through um, some of the explorations that I've done. They're all I'm going to talk about have, have to do with the Drosophila embryo, which um, you have seen uh, a lot in Frank's uh, lectures already. I give you my perspective on introduction, and um, then we'll, we'll see as we go along. And so I want to also do something uh, uh, special in those two lectures here. Um, I didn't um, go through my early papers and kind of line them up and give you lectures about them. I want to give in both lectures a lot of, um, a a lot of uh, material that is actually unpublished. And so I'll bring you right there. Let's see, let's see if that works pedagogically. But uh, it's the first time I'm trying this. And so you kind of have to help me if I'm having too many holes in, in explaining you things about the background and, and how we're going to want to do things. And so very importantly, interrupt. So um, <clears throat> yes, we are interested in um, also in fly development, uh, sorry, in, in, in development in general, or in, in understanding how an organism, when it starts from a single cell and grows into many cells, how do these different cells in that organism, during the course of development, know where they belong? How does a cell know it has to be in the future head? How does a cell know it has to be in the future toe? It's a very important decision, and typically those decisions are made very early in development. And if you look at these early stages in development, here I'm showing you um, four movies that are all stole somewhere from the web. Uh, and I didn't mention, because it was too late, uh, too, sh too short in time, who they are coming from. So maybe some people in the audience don't be uh, offended. Happens to me as well. Um, so this here is a mouse embryo. There's a fish embryo that you probably have seen in CP's work. Here's a worm embryo you may see later. And here's a fly embryo. And um, what all these things have in common is that they start from a cell mass, very few cells. And all of these cells are completely identical. They could, each one of them, you can move them around in that, at that stage in the embryo. And they could take on the fate of any of the other cells. Okay, and so that means you start with a, with a mass of, of uh, uh, homogeneous uh, uh, cells, and um, somehow there are now signals that somehow sometimes come from the exterior, but sometimes also, often also within that system 
that kind of specify those cells and determine what those cells will do in the end. And so that is kind of, of at least of today's lecture, and also even of tomorrow's, uh, something that I that keep in mind that I will that that I will most, mostly focus on. And so um, we are focusing on the fly's development, and here you see uh, basically uh, 24 hours of the of a fly embryo. Um, as you saw in Frank's uh, uh, talk, a fly undergoes several stages. At first, the mother lays an egg. That egg takes a day to hatch, as you see here, into a larva. Um, and then that larva uh, takes six days to get bigger and eat food. And then over four days, there's pupation, where Frank showed these beautiful movies of how wings, under, among other things, form. Actually, all the organs form during that pupation time. And then a complete different organism, a fly, comes out and, and flies away. So the, the larva can only walk away after 24 hours, and the fly, after 10 days, can fly away. And so we are focusing on the, um, the very earliest stages. So here's, again, this picture that Frank has shown. We are just looking at this early embryo here. And um, what we would like to understand is how, when the larva comes out, the different segments of this larva have been formed, which means that you, have, you make cells, you make more and more cells, and um, eventually, uh, some a process called segmentation, which is a pattern forming process, has engaged, and which you see very nicely at the uh, at the outcome. But there is a blueprint of this already enshrined after three hours, when you have cells at the surface of the embryo that express different proteins, different genes. Okay. And these genes have a one-to-one -one connection. See, they're having the same kind of striped pattern here. And there's a one-to-one -one connection between this gene expression at three hours and this larva that comes out after 24 hours. Okay? And so within the first three hours, something really crucial and important happens for the larva to determine um, its future uh, structures. And it turns out that after three hours, you can, at certain places in the em embryo, get individual rows of cells that have a specific morphology. Okay, so here you see the, these cells look all seemingly identical, but there's one row that has, it's, it's called a furrow, that has some sort of an indentation. Okay, and we're going to talk about this one row in a bit and see how sharp this row already is. This goes back again to what Frank has been talking about. How do you make, you know, these sharp uh, boundaries along an entire axis, right? And so, here in this cartoon, I just want to emphasize again, because I'm going to stop talking about it for the rest then, um, that after three hours, you have these patterns, and there's a one-to-one -to -one connection between those patterns and the larva, and there's a one-to-one -one connection between the larva and these patterns in the fly, in the other fly. Okay? So the setup in the first three hours is crucial for this machine that crawls away after 24 hours or that flies away after 20, after 10 days um, can work, okay? And so that's why we're going to focus on those first three hours. And um, I'm just going to give you a brief overview, I guess, something that Stefano has alluded to. I just, again, for sake of coherence of my talk. Um, so the fly mother, she lays an egg that's roughly half a millimeter in size, so you can still barely see it with your eye. Um, and that egg has a single nucleus and no walls, no, uh, bound, no membranes or whatever. It's one single membrane that's around the embryo. And then over the course of two hours, that nucleus divides. It just divides, doesn't make any cells. It's called a syncytion, which you see here in this movie. So in this movie, we have tagged these nuclei with GFP. Um, is GFP okay with everybody, or shall I tell you what GFP means? Show me if you need GFP explained. You want GFP explained, okay. So these nuclei here, if you just put this embryo under a microscope, you don't see anything. The thing is white. If you look at it in fluorescence, the thing glows a little bit green, but there's not, not much that you can see. What you would like to see is, in this case, nuclei. And so what people have, invent, have, have figured out, it got a Nobel Prize a while ago, that um, you can take a piece of DNA from a jellyfish that encodes for a protein that is 
called green fluorescent protein, that when you shine a certain light, laser light on it, it will glow. And so um, you, can this, you can put this with molecular biology cloning and whatnot into a fly, put it in a germline so that the next fly uh, kits that come out have it out automatically, and then you can have your um, undergraduate put it under the microscope and get a movie like that. Okay, and so I'm going to use this a lot, this GFP, so that's why GFP is very important. And GFP tags proteins. And so what I have achieved with this is I put basically a, a piece of um, sequence that encodes for this green protein next to, in this case, a histone protein. Histones are nuclei. And so whenever the fly mother makes a histone protein and puts this in the embryo, this histone protein is now glowing green if you shine laser light on it. And so it's all over the embryo. That's why everything is a little bit glowing. But in the nuclei, it's concentrated, which is why you can see the nuclei. It has more, okay? It has higher contrast. All right. And so um, back to uh, uh, the work here. So basically, in two, within two hours, you see these nuclear divisions, 13 rounds. They're very beautiful. They're synchronous. You can ask how synchronous are they, etc. So there's already lots of physics, just if you look at, at these movies here. Um, then after two hours, miraculously, they stop. So there's a lot of research going into how do they know how to stop. And what happens then over the course of the next hour, there is a cell membrane that comes down from the cortex. So this here is the outer shell, this shell here. We just There's a little movie in here. And you see there's a, a cell wall coming down. Okay, well, cell membrane, whatever. I say wall, but it's not a plant. Last time I went to a summer school, they thought I was talking about plants because I use wall. I use the word wall because I'm a physicist and I don't distinguish. Okay, it's a, it's a membrane. Um, but I might stay, say wall again. And so this, take, this process takes one hour. So basically what the embryo has done, is the, it's, it, it, in fact, it's the world champion in making and proliferating cells. Every 10 minutes, bam, 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 you get a, another factor of two more cells. And it only goes so fast because it doesn't bother making cell membranes. Um, it basically does that in a process later once it has 6,000 cells. And so then after three hours, a process called gastrulation happens. That's what CP has talked about a lot in, in, in zebrafish, but it also happens in flies. It happened in you. You did this. Some people say that this was more important. This is the most important event in your life, more important than your marriage or whatnot. And... At this level, it becomes a little too complicated for me. I'll pass it on to CP, and I'll just study everything beforehand. So I'm trying to basically set up the system of how do we get to this stage here when everything looks, looks identical, but the cells, of course, all have already individual, different identities such that they can generate the forces that are necessary to gastrulate. Okay? So in a way, my work is lead up to CP's work, I want to give him his initial conditions so he can, can look at gastrulation. Or, in, in fact, in my case, it's for people who do gastrulation flies. But. All right, so um, how, do, how do we get there? How, how is it possible that there's now this one single row of cells here that does something special? You see this row splits, in, a, in, a, in fact, the future head of the embryo from the rest of the body? Well, it turns out that under, at the same time that these nuclei here divide and you have all these dynamic processes, in parallel, simultaneously, you have a cascade of genes that gets transcribed. You have three hours to transcribe genes. And so what happens is that the symmetry is broken by the mother, right? You look at this egg and you see it's not symmetric anymore. So it has, it has poles. And so at these poles, what the mother does over the course of several days, like two to three days in the mother's belly, she puts all sorts of good stuff in the embryo that, it, that she's preparing. It's called an oocyte at that point. And in, among others, it's the histones that you have already seen, because the embryo can't make them itself at that stage. Uh, so she puts it in there. But she also localizes sources, they are, they're called mRNA molecules, at the different poles. And these sources, upon fertilization, they're sources for protein. They get translated at time zero at this point here. They start to be translated. And they establish gradients that span the entire egg. Okay, so there's a protein now that gets made here at this source and it diffuses along the embryo axis to establish a, an exponentially decaying gradient. Okay, and that protein is a transcription factor. It enters the nuclei. 
binds to DNA and tells downstream genes to turn on or not. And there's several, there's three types of these. There's one that comes from this end. There's another one that comes from that end. And there's a third one that comes from this end. Okay, which is something I'm not, I'm only going to focus today about the long axis called the anterior posterior axis. And so then you have a cascade of genes. So there's, a, there's these broad expression patterns that are directly determined by these so-called maternal gradients. And then these turn on more refined gene expression patterns in seven stripes. And then together, where a row of this guy and a row of this guy overlap, so red and green in this universe gives you yellow, that yellow row determines this indentation. And so you, can, you see roughly how this works. That doesn't mean that this explains why this is a single row of cells and why this row of cells is here and not here. Okay, and so that's something we want to we want to focus on in the in a, in a bit. All right. So to recapitulate, because I'm going to use this continuously, the mother puts up a source of mRNA molecules at one pole. That's why it's called maternal mRNA. That mRNA at time t equals zero starts to be translated makes protein that diffuses into a protein gradient. That's, called, that's why it's called maternal gradient, because it stems from the mother. And then these, and there are several of them, and these gradients turn on a first level of genes. They're called gap genes. So those are zygotic genes. So they're genes that now the little embryo does itself. Okay? It doesn't need the mother for that. It just needs the mother to instruct it where to turn on which one of them, or the mother signal, at least. And so then together, these guys, those material gradients plus those broad gap gene expression patterns, they determine these more refined um, so-called parallel genes, which come in seven stripes and which you may have seen uh, at the cover of magazines or winter schools. And then these individual stripes, they overlap. There are seven different genes of this class. There are seven genes that make seven stripes. If that's a coincidence or not, I actually don't know. Um, but it's seven and seven. And so where they overlap, they det can determine a single row of cells that um, in then, in then has, has this, this, the first morphologic change in the, in the fly's development, if you want. All right. So here now are, again, the times. So in the, over two days, the mother prepares this. And then over three days, it, if over three, it takes three hours to get to the first morphological marker. And this, the, the, the network, if you want, the gene regulatory network, has three different levels, at least. That's what I want to focus on. There's these maternal inputs that the mother sets up that get inactuated at time t equals zero. There is this processing layer, which are called gap genes. They're coming broad expression patterns. And they interact with each other. They interact with the maternals. And then, as an output, you see these seven-stripe genes. And there are seven kinds of them. And in order to identify those individual cells, it takes another three to five hours. At least that's the current picture. Because there's yet a fourth layer of cells. They're called second polarity genes, which come in, in, seven stri in 14 stripes. And so it's believed that over the course of these three to four hours more, on top of those three hours, that every single column of cells here will be able to determine its fate. Okay? That's the, uh, that's the paradigm. And so, of course, in this system now, uh, there's many things you can, you, can, you can ask. One thing to ask, for instance, is how, how precise can you position a single row of cells? Yeah, is it, why is it just a single row, and why is it here and not you know, five rows over or one row over. If you look at many embryos and you line them all up, is that single row here always at the same location or does it fluctuate a bit? Because if it fluctuates a bit, there's error and somehow the system has to cope with that in the end. Right? Um, or, or maybe not. So these things uh, we, we, we would like to figure out. Um, Something I took out because I saw that Frank talked about it in, in, in depth. In this system, we also have to see the problem of scaling. Because um, 
I, I told you that things happen by diffusion, so the gradient is set up by diffusion. Um, but it turns out that these embryos, they come in very different flavors and sizes. So there's a factor of, of five in difference between different species that all have enshrined that same network, that same patterning network. And so they all make the same kind of patterns with the same genes in the same amount of time. But in one case, you need to diffuse five times more than in the other. So how do you do that? Or is diffusion even a valid mechanism for this to work? Right? Because we know from physical pattern formation, which works by via diffusion, if you change the size of the box by a factor of five, you make five times more patterns. Right? The, the wavelength stays the same. Right? The, take icicles in the winter. They all, you know, if you make the street lamp twice as large, you have twice as many icicles, right? Um, and that's a equilibrium between tension and gravity. Um, so if there's something special in biological pattern formation, because obviously that wouldn't work. You don't want to have a fly that you make five times larger and it has five times as many heads or pairs of wings, right? So in biology, something is, is controlled in a different way. I'm not going to talk about that today, though. Um, Let's go back to the, 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 the question about precision in development. So you, um, you generate, a, uh, you generate a, uh, a fly in, in 24 days, uh, sorry, 24, uh, sorry, in 10 days. And um, somehow, in the end, things look quite reproducible. Yeah, if you look at uh, the wing that I've put up here, and the wing that Frank had this morning, they look very similar. We know um, another developmental system, which are humans, of course. You know that twins in humans, they look very much the same, right? Sometimes you can barely distinguish them. <laughs> so we know that there is a potential for development or developmental machines, programs, to produce something that looks very much identical. Yeah? And in fact, the wing of a fly should be reproducible because if it isn't, you need to find mechanism of how the fly avoids flying against that column or a tree in nature. Okay? And so there is an incentive for things to be reproducible. But the question is, how do you, how do you actually get there? Because, oh, sorry. Um, I just basically, before, I, before I'm talking about this, let me tell you how reproducible things are. So I, I basically um, alluded to that one, to the precision of a single row of cells in the early embryo, this morphologic uh, furrow that, that drives in. Um, but we wanted to see if, if other developmental features are just as reproducible. And so yes, by eye I can say my wing looks similar to Frank's wing. But it's better to measure, right? And so um, let's take a bunch of these wings and morph them on top of each other. So we scale them, we rotate them, and we translate them so that they look as close as possible than they can get. Than they can get. And we do this with 82 of them. And then we ask, where are these crossing points here? That you can ask a computer to do that for you. And um, if you take these 82 wings and put the crossing points all on top of each other, you see that the distribution function of those crossing points is extremely tight. Okay? What does extremely tight mean? Well, it's, you, you, this is a qualitative statement. You need to compare this to something that's actually relevant to the, embryo, to, the, to the system. And what's relevant to the system here is the size of a single cell. Because it's that size that determines whether you are in that wing vein here or whether you're in the wing blade. And you see that the size of a single cell is largest at this level of two sigma of these distributions here. Okay. And so those are wings that come from a random collection of flies that I got in my garden in New Jersey. Okay. So you take 82 flies that come from my garden, 
you morph their, their, their fly wings on top of each other. And the precision with which these crossing points here are made, and you can make this more, this was a high school student who did this, you can make this more sophisticated and actually you know, take the entire structure of these wing blades and whatnot. But just to make it simple, let's just take those crossing points. They are reproducible to within half a cell width. Yeah, you had a question? A little bit of both. It, they, have a, they have bigger cells, but they also have more. But the precision is still at the level of a single cell, yes. And so if I take, sorry, when I, if I misspoke. When I, if I take flies from my garden, they're wild type. They have, um, they have a precision of a single cell. But now if I make identical twins of flies, which is very easy because you just inbreed them so much that you get rid of all of genetic fluctuations. That width of this distribution here goes down from a single, from a linear dimension of a single cell to half a cell. Okay? And that precision of half a cell is the same than the left and the right wing of, that, of, a, of, an, of an individual fly. And so if you give me two wings, of a population of identical twin flies, I will not be able to tell you whether those two wings came from a single individual or from two random brothers and sisters, which is quite remarkable, right? I'm not going to do much more science with this, but I just want to throw this out there. What a biological system is actually able to do? Just characterizing this is of an interesting feat, because in a way, it gives you a very intuitive mechanism to generate symmetry. Because all you need is to make sure that things come out reproducible in the end. If you start from a, so these, these wings, in fact, uh, Frank was talking about wing discs, which are lots of cells. But a single wing disc comes from nine cells in a 10 hour old embryo. Okay? So every single wing in any single trilophila fly in the world comes from nine cells. And so you can think of mechanisms how an early embryo can count until nine. And if once, and nine on the left side and nine on the right side. And once you accept that, all you need is high fidelity in your process of generating those two wings and you have symmetry for free. It's a nice way to get symmetry. Which does not mean that if you fuck things up, that you cannot still get symmetry, so there are other mechanisms that compensate because it's such an important thing that the fly doesn't go against the tree but has symmetric wings. wings. But in principle, they're not needed if everything goes straight. You had a question there? Yes. That is true. There is probably error in, uh, in the production line. Um, but uh, if you look at uh, whatever the Fiat production line, you get also only cars that end up being cars, but you will never be able to get them as reproducible as uh, as this. Right? Or the same. Another example I typically give, because it's a little bit more complex than the Fiat production line, is if we were to shoot the Mars rover for a second time up there, it would certainly not unfold and do its spiel the same way it did it the first time. So getting something reproducible in engineering is a huge problem. And so somehow bio biology has figured it out. Yes, it kills a lot of things along, along the way, but still, you know, of the uh, 82 wild-type flies from my garden in New Jersey, wild-type still has a, has a survival rate of, you know, what is it, 98% or something. It's very, very high. But those 2%, yes, who knows what goes wrong there. And, and I'm not looking at that yet. There was another question? No. All right, so <clears throat> in the end, everything is reproducible. The question is, how do we get there? And so if you take the different stages of development as, you know, there are different nodes, different stages along which you, um, uh, that, that you undergo while you develop, one way of getting something reproducible is you start with something that's very noisy, where you have patterns that fluctuate all over the place, and then at each step, you have a mechanism that kind of refines that and that reduces the error bar. Okay, it's like a development is long, it's a big process, and you can just think of mechanisms that would reduce your, your, your noise. And in the end, 
using noise filtering and error correction, you get somehow to a reproducible outcome. On the opposite side, you have something that is very reproducible at the very beginning, a precise setup. And then what the system does is from going from step to step, from level to, from uh, uh, along these different developmental stages, what you do is you try to maintain that level of precision. You try not to lose it. Okay, that's a different strategy. And so the question is, what does our system do? And this is something I want to talk about um, a little bit today. But before, um, I just want to recapitulate of what uh, I've done so far. So um, I introduced this system as a pattern forming system. I want to understand how, you know, how do you make these different patterns? How do individual cells know where they are and what to become in what time frame with what kind of signals, etc. But, and it has been classically used as a pattern formation system. But there's a, this network of the different, the maternal gap and, and uh, payroll genes also gives you very nice access to study properties of gene regulatory networks in general. Okay, so I can hijack this embryo and use it as a laboratory and study genetic networks. At this, all the while, the outcome of the genetic network is significant because it does something for pattern formation. But I just want to emphasize that these are two different approaches of questions that you can ask. One is like scaling of pattern, that's a pattern formation question, but the other is how does a genetic network actually encode scaling? That's a genetic network question. Okay? And so we are kind of, today, I'm talking about things that are at the brink between those two um, disciplines that can both be addressed with the fly embryo. And tomorrow, I'm talking a little bit about the mechanisms of transcription regulation because, of course, this network here is a transcription network. Every single member of this network is a transcription factor, and you see all these errors here. They all influence each other. And so transcription seems to be the crucial process that makes this network, brings this network to life. And so understanding something at the molecular level of transcription will then help you to understand something at the network level will then help you to understand the larger microscopic pattern formation uh, processes. Yeah? Yeah? Sorry, what about Hunchback and Giant? Yeah. I have no idea. That may be true. I have actually no idea. So I, I use this picture just because it's complicated and nice. Um, <laughs> I really don't know who influences who. I, all I know is that there's a feed forward from this level to this level to that level. There's a little bit of interaction, and that's all I really want to know. Because I would like my approaches to get me this diagram out. And I'll, I'll show you a little bit how I'm trying to approach this. Okay? It is true that each one of, so yeah, I don't want to belittle this too much, each one of these errors here, probably a PhD student had to figure out. But so now we would like to step back a little bit from this and try to see what is it that really makes this network work in a more global sense, like how do you get scaling to work in this network? How do you get reproducibility to work, to work in this network? Okay, and for that, the hope is that the individual errors, one individual error at least, one particular individual error should not be important. Okay? All right, so how do you make a, how do you make a pattern? So the, the classic model of how you make a pattern is essentially by a so-called threshold readout. And that goes back to um, the early, the, the late 60s, um, when it was proposed that the way how you could make a boundary is you take a gradient and you say, well, wherever that gradient is higher than a certain concentration, I take a downstream gene and turn it on. And wherever it's lower than a certain concentration, I keep that downstream gene off. Okay? So that means there's something very crucial happen at that in these nuclei here because they have to determine between on and off. And because we're talking about molecules 
that are being read out, right? So transcription factors are protein molecules. And in these early stages, the concentrations are very low. You have maybe tens, maybe hundreds of these protein molecules. And so that means that if, you read, need, if your DNA needs to read what is the concentration of these proteins, but we're talking you know, double-digit numbers, your fluctuations of that measurement that the DNA must make in order to read out that concentration, they are huge. And so there's a potential for huge fluctuations of this boundary because any of these cells might be just as well determining we are on. Okay? If you look at the downstream gene, though, thing, things seem to work beautifully. So, there's, so this is a gene called Bicoy. It doesn't really matter. It's, it's the one that was anchored here and the diffusion gradient that got established over two hours. And then at stage two hours, if you measure, you see that there is a really seemingly on-off readout of that protein concentration. Okay? And so the model that has been proposed is that these morphogens, that's what these things are called, they can basically determine at different levels of concentration different uh, levels of uh, uh, different downstream genes. It's called the French flag model and goes back to Louis Wolpert. Okay. Now, there's problems with this model and one I just alluded to. The numbers of molecules are very low and so there's potential for a lot of noise. And, um, but it's actually very hard to pinpoint that problem. Um, and so, however, in the last you know, decade or so, um, there are a bunch of labs who have contributed to kind of putting doubts on this model, and I'm not going to talk about all of them. I'm only going to talk about the ones that come from my lab, obviously, um, because that's not really what I want to talk about. Uh, in the, in the, this is not what the talk is about. I just want to give you an example of what you can, what you can do. And so it turns out if you take this gradient here and you ramp it up and down, you um, can move this, cephalic fur this so-called cephalic furrow back and forth. Okay? You basically can make a fly that has twice as much of this uh, source molecules, and so it will create a gradient that comes from twice as high and goes down. Okay? And so now you move all of the patterns towards the posterior, and that means that you move the cephalic furrow, which is the readout of all of these patterns, towards the posterior. And you can, take the, you can do the opposite. You can ramp this thing down and move everything towards the anterior. Okay? And so if you measure now the, um, the dosage of how much protein you have and the location of where the cephalic furrow here is, you get, um, you get data that looks like this here. So these different colors here correspond to different um, embryo, so, so to, to different fly lines that have different nominal numbers of copies of mRNA, copies of the gene, basically, of picoid, and hence copies of mRNA in the fly. And so on this axis here, you basically ramp up the source strengths. And on this axis here, you basically measure where is this uh, location of the cephalic furrow. Okay? And because this is a, a log normal plot, if we are in a scenario where this gradient is a diffusion gradient, where you can fit it with a, with a diffusion, with, sorry, where this is an exponential gradient, um, in that case, you, are, um, you expect your data to lay on a straight line. Okay? And because you can measure, so this is your data for these, for these uh, exponential gradients. You can fit an exponential very nicely, and you get a straight line, and because it's a measurement, you have an error bar, which is this, this line, this dotted line here. Okay, and this line measures basically the length constant lambda that you get, that gives you the sharpness of this gradient. It's e to the minus x over lambda, okay? So now, this, our data that we collected, also does lay on a straight line, but the straight line doesn't have a slope of lambda, it has a slope of lambda over two. And so something fishy is going on here. We kind of do predict that we have 
the desired relationship, but quantitatively, the number is reduced by a factor of two. And so it turns out that you can explain this, at least partially, by um, looking at uh, mutant flies that lack the other maternal inputs. So I told you there's another source here that creates a gradient that goes this way. And then there's a third gradient that has source molecules on both ends, but where the gradient is much sharper. It, it falls off after like five cells or so. Okay, so there's three maternal gradients that span this axis here. And if you knock either one or both of the other two gradients out, you kind of get data points that will start to fall on the line with slope lambda. Okay? And so what that means is that the direct readout, if you just have this guy to read out, might work in a threshold-dependent manner. But if you have other genetic components that are integrated in the system, there's a network effect that kind of um, has to be taken into account. And, in, and indeed, this only works very early if, um, so this only works like at two hours of, of, of development. If you look at the same thing after three hours, when the GAP gene and parallel gene network has come to, fru uh, to flourishing, because it's during that hour that this network really is uh, inactuated, things kind of shift from this line to that line, and so there's a dynamic effect that comes from the integration of the different components of the network. Okay? And so there's a network effect that's at place here, and that's kind of what we are after. That's, and this is kind of what I'm after in this, in, this, in this lecture. How do we get access to those network effects? Any questions? Yeah? No, no, I don't think this talks about diffusion because this is really about the readout of the gradient, how the gradient is set up. Um, all I, all I, all I uh, assumed here is that this is an exponential decay and that I can do with a fit and the fit is very good. Now, can I explain what this lambda here is? That's a different question. And there, yeah, there comes diffusion into play. But whether I can fit an exponential or not, I think that's independent of that. Okay? It tells us something about how this is read out, because my readout here is really the output of the system. It's a cephalic furrow, right? It's not really the setup of the gradient. Yeah? Didn't say a few more words about the internal gradients. Yeah, so, so you, you, make, you, so you make an embryo, and here you put source molecules. It's like in your bathtub. You have a bathtub, and you have ink on this side, black, blue ink on that side, and red ink, ink on that side, and at time zero, you put a drop of ink in there. So it's doing it at the very end of the mother. Oh, sorry, no. No, 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 sorry. Um, what I, maybe I didn't say this, but the mRNA molecules that are anchored, they, are only, they only become active when the fly, when the, when the egg gets activated, when the egg gets fertilized. And that is, happens at the same time when the mother pushes the egg out of its oviduct. Okay? Exactly, they're frozen patterns. In fact, there is a pH change. And the pH is such that when the sperm is not yet in the egg, uh, the mRNA is not translated. And as soon as the sperm is in the egg, the pH changes, and now the mRNA gets translated. And that starts at time t equals zero of our counting here. Um, and then it takes 90 minutes for the gradient to stabilize. And then um, once that has happened, um, this thing MBT starts, which Stefano probably talked about. Did you? a little bit, where zygotic genes get activated, and these gap genes, the first readouts of these gradients, are part of that. They start to get activated roughly, you know, 90, 100 minutes, but really, 
when they really come to full fruition is between fruition is between hour two and hour three, and I'm going to show you that in a couple of slides. Okay, but yeah, you're right. It's very important to get this, to catch the setup. Are there any other questions here? So eventually, right, this, the slides that you eventually get out from this presentation is proportional like a wild type slide, right? Yes. So, so this, the, the remaining correction mechanism happens later during development or still controls your Peru? So does it happen at the level of the Peru bin or your seven stripes or that's a later? Yeah, so Stefano is asking about the, about the question, well, if you make, if you put so much of that source molecule in there that you shift everything to the posterior, now all your patterns, all your seven stripes, they are maybe in, the, in one third in the posterior, one third of the embryo. But somehow, in those kind of flies, 18% of those flies actually do survive. So much, much less than the 98 that we had for real wild type. And so that means that somehow the thing can compensate. And there is, in fact, a compensation mechanism that goes over the entire um, 24 hours of, embryos, of the embryo's development. Some of it is corrected here. And in part, this is this correction there, but not all of it. OK? All right. So um, we would like to understand these kind of network effects. Oh. Was that also part of your question? That's what I thought, because how can multiple, M multiple gradients affect the same gene? Does anybody want to know this? How can multiple gradients can affect the same gene? So it turns out if you, make, if, you make a, if you want to make a gene, and I'm going to talk about this more tomorrow, um, there's a part of your genome that encodes for the part of that's eventually going to be a protein. But there's also part of the pro uh, the, your, your, your genome to which transcription factors, these proteins bind and tell the machinery that makes genes to make their gene or not. Otherwise, each cell would make all of your genes. And those little, those regions, they're called, they're so-called enhancer regions. And to these enhancers can bind multiple transcription factors. Okay, so you have a, uh, you have a piece of DNA that encodes for the future protein. You have a thing that's called a promoter where the machinery binds that makes that protein. Well, it first makes mRNA, but never mind. And then around that promoter region, there are other little sequences to which the proteins, the transcription factors bind, that tell the machinery to make or not the gene. Okay? And so those many transcription factors, they all get integrated. And then the machinery decides, okay, I like that integration, and I'm going to make the gene or not. All right, so okay. So basically, if we want to get access to network level effects, and you come from a physics background, it turns out that one viable approach in doing this is to um, try to measure fluctuations in the expression levels of the genes that determine those network level effects. Yeah, in physics, when we measure fluctuations, we can measure correlations of these fluctuations across space and time. And those correlations give you often very large scale effects. And there, in my case, would be network effects. Okay? Because it's um, uh, across the entire network that I would like to see which gene influences which. And I would like to do that by measuring the fluctuations, by extracting that from the fluctuations. And that goes back to your question, to earlier question before. That's why, in part, I'm not so interested in the actual links, whether this one, this gene affects this one, or this one represses that one, because I would like my approach to back that out. OK? And so, however, if you really want to understand fluctuations of gene expression levels, you need to be able to make measurements that have access to those fluctuations. You cannot just measure the means. And so um, in order to do that, uh, we developed a protocol and took us roughly 12 years to be able to do that. So it, even in biology, you can spend on the same stupid method 12 years in order to get it to, uh, to the point where you can actually make a physics-style measurement with it. And that measurement 
And, these, these, and, and this experiment is one of the earliest experiments that I actually did when I went into the system. It's based on antibody stainings. Yeah, so you, you may ask, well, why don't you keep the thing alive? Isn't that a much better measurement? And that's the same question that Frank got earlier today. Um, and there's something to say for, yes, doing things live. However, if you do things live, you don't look at the system that you're meant to look at. You're looking at some sort of a transformer, at, at an X-Man, right? Because you have now put tags into your live system because you want to measure something. And so it's no longer the actual system you want to look at. So whatever you do, you would perturb the system. And so my perturbation, at least for today, tomorrow, all I'm going to, all I'm going to do today, tomorrow is live. So don't worry, there will be live. But today, the perturbation I choose today is death. Okay? Tomorrow, the perturbation I'm going to choose is, okay, I put some weird stuff in the fly, and it's, it's a mutant, or it's a transformer. Today, the perturbation is death. But it's controlled death. And so it took me 12 years to control the bugger's death, okay? Or at least to control the death such that I can still make measurements. And I just want to lead you a little bit through this because it's, uh, it's, um, it, it was a tour de force and it's important. Oh, God, I already talked almost for an hour here. Yeah. Well, who knows? Maybe tomorrow you're not going to see live stuff. Um, so, shall I go faster or is the speed okay? Am I boring you guys? Okay, I'm going at that speed. Then you may not see a lot of live stuff. He's making jokes. Pardon? He's making jokes. Okay. Um, and, so, and so what we chose, so the first thing we did, so let's choose this layer and try to make measurements in this layer. So we, we see this as an input into our network and this is an output of our network. And so let's try to see if we can understand those four genes. And in fact, in that layer, there may be a little, even more genes than four, but those are the four major ones. And there's reasons to believe why they are, and I'm gonna, we can talk about those later. And so let's just see if by just measuring these four genes, how far can we get. But if you want to measure fluctuations of genes, um, you need to make measurements of these nodes, simultaneous measurements of all nodes. Right? Because otherwise, you measure one gene in one embryo and another in another embryo, well, you have no idea of how they were co correlated, right? And so that's already not trivial. Because the technology, as I said, is antibody stainings. And the way antibody stainings works is you take a piece of the protein that you want to stain, and you inject that piece into a rabbit, and that rabbit is going to make antibodies against that piece of foreign protein. You bleed the rabbit, you get the antibodies, and now it's a rabbit antibody, and you can buy from Sigma a little general class antibody that will detect that antibody, and you can fluorescently label that one. So it's a pretty laborious step, right? And I pretend to be able to make that quantitative. Just, you know, just let it sink in what a weird way this is to make a measurement. You take, you take a thing that you want to measure, put in a different animal, have that animal's immune system react to it, bleed it, extract the antibodies, put the, take your embryos, kill them with methanol, with a microwave, with all sorts of stuff. You poke holes in them, because otherwise nothing goes in there. Once the holes are in there, you take your first antibody from the rabbit and you put it in there. So that antibody now hopefully detects a few of your proteins. Now. You wash them away because you want there's lots of excess antibodies that you don't want to be recognized. Then you take the second antibody that hopefully detects only the antibody from the rabbit. So that works by taking a bunch of proteins from rabbits and inject them into goat and have the goat immune system make rabbit antibodies. And those sigma labels with you with the lexa probes of your chosen color. And then you label, then you apply that to your whole embryo. You wash it free again, and then you do this four times because you want four genes. And for instance, a mouse and a rabbit, sorry, a ma so you, you, you do this in, in, for in, sorry. I already used a goat and a, and a, and a rabbit, right? Um, but now I need to use six more animals because I can't use again a rabbit because then that antibody would detect the wrong protein, or would be confused which one to detect. Okay? And so you need to use lots of animals, and they also should not overlap. If you use a mouse and a rat, they're very similar, 
And that does, that's a no, that doesn't work. And that's just of the antibodies. You also need to be careful of your spectra, right? If you want to use red and infrared and yellow and green, you need four different colors, right? Maybe you want to also see your nuclei, that's a fifth color, and you won't want those colors to overlap because if you want to make measurements, then you run into trouble. And so, <clears throat> let me tell you that these measurements, these problems are easy. That's not the biggest source of mistake. The biggest source of mistake comes from the fact that these are your measurements when you're done. I just want to give you, so we, I did, we identified, I think, uh, 12 sources of error. There's error that is systematic and there's error that is measurement. All the stuff that I talked about today, uh, just now, was systematic error. So there are things you can do. It just takes you a few years to figure them out. Systematic error are very, very hard. But once you're done with systematic error, you still have measurement error. Okay? And so I'm going to give you a few examples for a systematic error and a few examples for measurement error just to see how we deal with them. So here's the first example for systematic error. You take 170 embryos and ask your um, graduate student to measure. Okay? Uh, this is just for one gene. And so what they do is they kill embryos and put them in a microwave and that freezes development at one stage. If you get a good grade, I mean, sorry, if you get a good um, sample of flies, you can actually work that sample of flies, such that you only get embryos between hour two and hour three, because that's the time frame you want to look at. And that's an easy time frame, because I told you there's no nuclear divisions, and so I can just count nuclei, and I know, oh, I'm in that time frame. But then you put this, do this with 170 em uh, embryos, and you see this mess. And so the problem, part of this, and, and a part of this mess comes from the fact that there's time, it's still a one hour window, and over that time, the gene expression gets really turned on and evolves. And so you need to kind of deal with that. And so you need, to, you need, you need a better, better measure of time than just counting nuclei. Because with counting nuclei, you just eliminated embryos that aren't even on this slide here. And so you need to find a clock. And one way to clock the embryo during that time window, during that one hour, is that membrane that comes down from the cortex. Because you can measure the progression of this membrane as a function of time. And you see that it's a monotonically increasing function. Right? So that's good, because now I can use this distance and read off time. I just use this function. But that only works, of course, if the embryo in which I measured this, which was, which was of course, a live measurement, and the embryos that are on my slide, where I can also measure this here, they are reproducible. But I, I need to figure out whether that's actually a valid way to look at it, right? And so here we repeated this measurement, this live measurement, in 10 embryos. And you see they all fall on top of each other. There are arrow bars here. These black things are bars, and they're barely see, you can barely see them. So much for developmental reproducibility. Okay, so those are 10 different embryos. They have nothing to do with each other. They are not even identical twins. They're just wild-type embryos. They are indistinguishable along this curve. Here. And so that means, first of all, that we have now a way to estimate time with two and one minute precision, depending on where we are, what the slope here is. But it also is a nice example, beautiful example, for how reproducible things are at that stage of development. And so once you do this, and you restrict yourself in a five-minute window, you get a much tighter uh, distribution of, of uh, expression level. So what we're looking at here is the intensity along this rim here. OK, so you take a little window. You slide it along the rim, and you, get, and you have ex intensity as a function of, of egg lengths. OK, that's the pattern. All right? And that's for 17 different embryos. So another source is that these embryos, when you throw them onto your glass light, they are round, right? And so they have a random orientation when they come, when they fall. Um, well, if you really had them random orientation, then you would have an, an issue because the uh, patterns are not symmetric in the azimuthal angle here. And so you need to find out a way to do that. So you can pinch them on a, on a little copper wire and do like a chicken rotisserie. So there's a bunch of things that you need to do in order to really get rid of noise and whatnot, of systematic noise. 
And once you're done with your systematic noise, you still have noise in the in the in the in the in the uh, in the system, and that's our measurement noise. So here, I show you for the four different genes, the four different patterns in a four-minute window of development. It was what uh, around 40 minutes plus minus two minutes, and you see there's still some residual jitter. So this guy here is one profile, and it's this one here, the the, the bold one. And so then you need to go in and quantify your measurement error. So your instrument has, has, has noise, um, whatever, the overlap of the, the spectra, there's a little bit of noise, the cross-reactivity of your antibodies, there's a little bit of, all of these things where I tried this with systematics to take out as much noise as possible, there's still some residual measurement noise. And when you get all the measurement noise sources together, you see, so in, in green, in, sorry, in, in color, you see the total noise after we took out all the systematics, and in the different shades of gray and black here, you see the contributions from measurement error. And you see that at no stage do we have more than 20% uh, of these profile variations that are uh, from measurement noise. And so the overwhelming um, uh, amount of noise that we have here is really biological noise. Okay? And so what I will do now, working on, is I keep it like this, and I will not subtract the contributions of measurement noise, and keep that in mind for my assertions that I make about my system. Because just um, subtracting the variance is a dangerous thing to do, especially if you have several sources of measurement noise, because you know they're not all disjoint. And so it's better to actually keep, make sure that your no actual noise your actual measurement is very low, that your biological noise is overwhelming, and then keep working with that, with that noise, yeah? So for each of those sources, for each source of measurement noise, you need to make an individual measurement. And um, in particular, you often need to you know, invent, it's, it's, a different, it's always an, a different experiment. And so for each one, you need to come up with a different experiment. And so, for instance, what the spectral overlap is, you can just swap your channels, you can swap your antibodies, you can swap your, your colors, etc. You can use different colors. You can make sure that uh, your, your, you, know, you make your colors as disjoint as possible used to, to see that your overlap is reduced, etc. So each one of those sources, I mean, we, after the talk, we can go through each one of them, but there's a bunch, and for, e for each one, you need a different experiment. Pardon? Yeah. Yeah. So as you may have noticed through my talk, my premise is to convince you of that things are very precise. And if I keep my measurement noise in the actual noise and I convince you that things are precise, if I would be able to take out the measurement noise, it would be even more precise. You see what I mean? So that's the line of work I have to do. Okay? You keep it, and you do it. You keep it such that it's to your disfavor. If I was going to convince you that it's noisy, then I can't do that, right? I only can do that because I'm trying to convince you that it's precise. Yeah. Oh, very good question. I didn't say that. The nuclei, the cells, are only on the cortex. Okay, those are the ones that give rise to those patterns. There are a few that have fallen inside, but they are, for us, boring. Okay? They are also useful, but uh, I'm not going to... The only ones that, have, that matter are really... There's a single layer, a single shell of, of nuclei, basically. All right, so the first thing you can do if you have this, you can look at the means and so reconstruct the dynamics. And so here you see in this one-hour window how the network turns on because we now have a one-minute precision with which we can order the embryos. And so this is a reconstructed movie from reproducible, ordered, time-ordered embryos. And so here are the gap genes, and here are the parallel genes, and you see how they turn on. Then I can ask, well, how much do these boundaries here fluctuate? And it turns out they fluctuate. Um, so you basically measure, you look at all the embryos in that time window, and you measure the delta x 
and plot that as a function of x. And if you do this at the different boundaries, you see in the background are the, the genes at this time window. You do this for different boundaries, you see that the sigmas hover around the 1%, roughly 0.8% egg length line. And lo and behold, that corresponds to half a cell diameter. Something that sounds familiar from the wing, right? But now I wanted to sell you this as a network effect. And also, I would like to measure not just at the boundaries, but everywhere what's the precision of my network, of my, of my, uh, of my patterns. And so for this, this information is in the covariance matrix, because the covariance matrix really gives you the fluctuations that two genes have, on, have on, as an effect on each other. Okay, so this is a four by four matrix, um, and we can measure that matrix because we have so little measurement error. And so, from that, we can then construct a function that, that we call sigma x, which is a function that depends on locally on where you are in the embryo, that basically tells you the combined effect of the fluctuations of all four genes at one given location along the embryo axis. And you have these derivatives because you do error propagation, because what you really want, sorry, what you did here was you really measure the fluctuation in x of those boundaries, right? But that's not what the embryo does. What the embryo does, it experiences fluctuations in concentration, so in the y-axis, and it needs to determine based on those fluctuations, not based on them, but despite those fluctuations, it needs to determine where am I in x. So we really need to take into account the fluctuations in C, translate them in x, in order to really see how precise the system is. And so that's what this function here does. And once you're done, you see that this is a, it's a continuous function now because, as I said, it depends on x, and it hovers very nicely also around this line of half a cell diameter. Okay, so, and of course this could never have been predicted by just looking at the means. This is, uh, or by looking at a single gene, this is truly a network effect, right? It comes from the fluctuations that are in your covariance matrix. Yes? Sorry, what? They are just nuclear, yes. Um, the cell size is the, dime, is the difference between the, it's half, it's the distance between two nuclei, let's say. Okay. They will become cells and that quantity is conserved. It just shifts by half a cell diameter. Sorry, what is the time information? The time information? So I'm only looking at one time window. Okay, I could look at all of them. I look at one particular time window, and that's the time window. I choose that astutely to be the time window when the genes have maximal expression. You saw in that movie before, they came up and went a little bit down, so it's at that maximum peak. All right, so I'm a little bit torn. Maybe I should skip something here, because otherwise I'll not. So I was going to tell you now that there's nothing special about transcription, because transcription is a noisy process. I told you about the individual molecules that have to be measured, et cetera. So that is noisy, and there's a lot of noise about transcription in the last you know, two decades that came up, systems biology, et cetera. And so the question is, is there something special about development that things are not noisy? Is there something special about that fundamental process of transcription that makes it less noisy in development than in in real, in other systems like bacteria or yeast, where people typically look at noise in transcription. Um, and the answer is no. It's just as noisy, but I think I'm going to do this tomorrow, uh, because tomorrow I'm going to talk about transcription anyways. And so now I want to tell you just a little bit more about the precision and how we then use this to do more network stuff. And so what I just showed you was that we have. Um, fluctuations in uh, what I just showed you is that the fluctuation in these patterns happens around roughly 1%. Okay? Um, and that corresponds to this error propagation to 10% in fluctuations in the concentrations. Okay? So the cell has to face a 10% concentration fluctuation, but that is enough to 
determine boundaries with a precision of, of 1%. Okay? Now it turns out that that precision of 10% is along this entire cascade. So if you measure the precision of, or the reproducibility, if you want, of the number of source molecules from one embryo to the next, we developed a method to count individual molecules of mRNA in individual embryos. Turns out there's roughly 900,000 mRNA molecules. And we were able to measure 900,000 molecules with error bars that are low enough to estimate that the fly's error is roughly 8%. Then the protein levels are 10% in the maternals, as they are in the gut genes, as what I just showed you, and also in the, in the, in the parallel genes. And then error propagation tells us that 10% corresponds to 1%. And that's what we see in the boundaries along this entire cascade, all the way to the cephalic fur. Okay? And so that means that we are not in an error correction type funnel of development, but that we are in a scenario where we're basically starting with something very precise and making sure that at each step we maintain, well, we, the system maintains that precision. Okay? And curiously, it turns out that it's at the maximal level of precision that it can possibly be at. Because there's no need for the system to do it any better than the lattice spacing, which is a single cell, right? And so there's something optimized here. Something smells like evolution has driven this system to working as good as it gets. That's the first signature. Actually, the flatness of this line here, that line here is another signature. Because that's a signature for information that's processed through this GAPG network is distributed optimally along, this, along the entire axis. Okay, the, fact that, the fact that this line here is flat and uniform is a signature that the information transmission, so information in the Shannon sense of information theory, that that information is optimized. And you can show that analytically. And I was hoping to get there towards the end, but I only have 15 minutes left. So I doubt I will get there. All right, so um, so far, it's nice to show that this is what the system has, that there's this 1% precision, and that it's seemingly optimized, et cetera. And you know, physicists get excited about this because you know, things are precise, and it's always exciting to physicists. But that does not mean that the biology actually is excited about it. And by the biology, I mean the system. It does not mean that the system actually has access to this 1%. We make measurements, fine, but does the system care about 1% precision? And so that's what I wanted to really tell you over the, next, over the last 15 minutes or so. Um, and the first step towards this is to see whether we can make the notion of positional information along this axis here, positional information meaning information of the cell about its location, whether we can, that, whether we can make that um, a little bit more explicit by using the concentrations of the gap genes for decoding of the network. Okay, and what I, might, what I mean by this is whether we can build a dictionary that allows us to take four concentrations of the four gap genes and then determine based on those four concentrations where is the cell that measures that four concentrations, those four concentrations. Okay, it's a different kind, slightly different way of looking at the same data. All right, so how do I do this? So um, what, I, what it means is I need to construct a probability distribution that takes in the four gap gene concentrations and spits out a probability that tells me at what position am I likely to be given that I have those four concentrations. Okay, that's a code. I'm building a code book. Um, and so... What I measure, however, is the opposite. I measure the prior, the prior, if you want. I measure, given a certain position along the axis, what is the probability of finding a certain concentration? Because those are these profiles that I have been showing you for the last hour. Okay, so here you have 
concentration as a function of position, but if you do this for many embryos, you con can construct a probability distribution of finding concentration along a certain position along the embryo. Okay? And so we have access to this guy, but we want that guy, and so we use something called Bayes' rule um, in order to transfer it. And so Bayes' rule is a very uh, popular a rule in statistics that essentially transfers exactly this function to that one by this transformation here, okay? Where P of cripple, P of Ki stands just for one of those four genes, it's called cripple. P of cripple concentration is basically just the projection of this probability distribution on the y-axis, so this is P of cripple here. And P of X is the probability of finding a nucleus somewhere. And you can just assume that that's uniform because the, the nuclei are uniformly distributed along the surface of the embryo. Okay, there's no denser regions or less dense regions, at least not for the, the, at the level of, at which we are looking at. All right, and so once you do this, you can put in the numbers and you can extract now a, uh, this probability of given a certain level of this cripple gene where am I in the embryo? So here's my cripple expression level. And here I can read off where am I in the embryo. And I show you for three examples of how this is done. So basically here, when you have this level of cripple, your probability distribution looks like that. And so now that means that you're confining your x to this little region here. If you're here, your probability distribution is too peaked and you're confining your x in either of these two, so now it's ambiguous. You're either on the upward or on the downward slope, you don't really know, just by measuring one, this one gene. And if you're measuring down here, well, you're measuring a lot of noise and you barely have no idea where you are. <clears throat> and so, this works well for one gene, but as soon as I want to add now two, three, or four genes, I can't use this notation anymore because I would need more dimensions in order to visualize it, yes? No, actually from four to one. All I want to know is where am I in X along this axis here. That's good. I'm happy for the challenge. What will I not always find? I may not, but let me maybe finish and you'll tell me in the end if I am. So with this one gene, I am not. With this one gene, I can uh, barely, with more or less precision, I can tell you if, if you're here, I can more or less tell you. If you're here, I have more precision on each of the slopes, but now it's ambiguous. I can be on the upward or on the downward one. So with one gene, I cannot, okay? But now I want to add more genes, and in order to add more genes, I need a different way to visualize things. And so um, we, are visual, we are using a so-called decoding map to do this. And that is, it's the same, it's just a different representation of the same kind of data. All I'm doing here is I'm basically, look, can, uh, I take these probability distributions and collapse them and put them on the y-axis. And so if I'm basically asking, well, if I measure a certain amount of x, what, am, what is my probability that I can find a certain position? Okay, and so I basically put myself here, and I, let's say I want to know what's going on at 0 0.55. Well, there's a probability here in the center, and so that maps me somewhere in that region here. Okay, it's a so-called decoding map. And, um, sorry. As examples, you have those same, same three examples here. If you're reading yourself off here, well, you're somewhere in that region in the center. If you are in the upward or downward slopes, you're either on this side or on that side. And if you're measuring out here in the noise, you barely have any idea where you are, okay? But this method of representing things, I can now expand to many genes. 
And here's essentially the math behind this. So we're making the approximation that embryo to embryo fluctuations in these gene expression levels, they're Gaussian. And we have reasons to believe that that's a very good approximation because we have done earlier work of where um, we actually we can actually show that. And th what that means is that your probability solution of finding, of having a certain, this is what we measure, right? Of having a certain set of genes given a particular position is given by a Gaussian. This is just a, uh, a, uh, a, um, um, how do you say, an expanded Gaussian to four dimensions. So if you only would have one gene, all you would do is you put here g minus g minus, uh, g minus uh, the expression level of the gene minus the mean of the gene, you square it, and you, you divide it by the variance. But if you expand this to four dimension, that variance becomes your covariance matrix, and you multiply uh, again by, by, uh, by the expression level minus its mean, and because you have four, and it's a four by four matrix, you do this on both sides with two different vectors. Okay, so there's just an expansion into four dimension of, a, of your regular Gaussian. And then once you have this, you construct your lookup table for any embryo alpha that is your, your sample now that you want to see where is it, how is it decoded in your, in your, in your dictionary. You take that embryo and um, basically find the most likely position X that's consistent with the state at which your embryo was given its expression levels. Okay, so it's, there's, it's not a model, it's just this pure probabilistic way of estimating position. And all the probabilities come from data and the Gaussian approximation, but we have very good reasons to believe that the Gaussian approximation is a very good approximation at the level of, at which we are looking. Okay, so this is not a model. This is purely based on data and probability driven. Okay, so now expanding this to two genes, Going back to the data, so now we are adding to this yellow guy, this, this was, which was peaked in the middle, we are adding this guy which was roughly on off. And um, now your lookup, your, your map, your dictionary, looks such that you're still ambiguous and imprecise in certain regions, but you see that you're populating more and more levels here in the, on the diagonal, uh, which means that you're map becomes more and more precise. And by the time you go to four genes, you see that along, this entire, along the entire length of your embryo now, you can determine with very good precision of where you should be given those four levels of, of genes, these four expression levels of the genes. Okay? And if you ask how precise can you do this, well, that precision is, of course, the width of this probability distribution here. And you can look at this width along the entire length of the embryo. And what you see is that you recover very nicely that function of sigma x, which was constructed from a completely different, in a completely different approach. Okay, so here, the, but what we gain, of course, is that here we can decode. Meaning here I can now give you, or you can give me four concentrations of the gap genes, and I tell you unequivocally with 1% precision where you are. And that 1% precision, we have reason to believe that that's mostly due to what you have, what the biology, what the, the residual biological fluctuations are. Okay, any questions so far? Yes? So, a single cell is kind of your limit of what you need. Okay, and so doing any better than this would be kind of redundant in the, in the, in the system. You could, of course, add more and more, more genes here. What we show in this case is that it's not needed. That with four genes, at least between, you know, 20 and 80% egg lengths, you're good to go. Okay? Yes, and you could also have more cells, and in that case, you probably would need more genes. Yes, I agree. 
Yeah. Is it true that uh, the question is the following? Is there any new information with regard to the past? Nope. Exactly. That's a good point. There is no new information. All we have now is that with this new approach, we can alter the code. But the information that I gave you with the old approach and with this new approach so far is exactly the same. I'm just going to show you in the next few slides of how we use this now to test the system and to really see whether it cares about this 1%. You had a question? Exactly, yes. Yeah? So you mean you I'm not sure I understand. So you're saying if I'm looking at 1% lines in between those 1% lines I get precision for free? Yes. Yes. It's a local. This is a local function, and I compute it at each x. Yes. I use exactly. I use only local information. No. Yeah. That's true. No, it's, it is used in terms of the covariance matrix, right? Okay. So, the uh, No, sorry, you're right. No, no, no. You're absolutely right. What is not used is fluctuations, correlations in fluctuations across space. We have not used those at all yet. You're right. All we have used is correlations in fluctuations from one gene to the next, locally, how they influence each other. We have not used spatial correlation. That is true. What this means is? In the correlations of, well, maybe, maybe not. So we have to check. So we saw long range correlations also in space. And we think that the system is tuned to a critical point, but that's a, it's for a different talk. But we can talk about it later. So that we see some correlations also in space. All right, so uh, let me test the system now. And so how can I do that? Sorry, were there other questions here before I continue? Um, so how can you test the system? Um, how long do I have? OK, but because there were so many questions already during the talk, I get those. OK, good. <laughs> I'll be fast. So um, what you can do is now you can ask, um, so how do you test the system? A way to test the system is to present the system with a different distribution of gap genes and see if, based on that dis dis different distribution of gap genes, it still determines the output the same way it did in the wild type case. Yeah? In the wild type case, I tell you, give me four concentrations at one position, and I tell you whether there is an eavesdrive or not, or whether you are on the edge of that eavesdrive or not. Okay? So if this is really working, and if the biology really cares about this 1% precision, then I, sh I should look in an embryo where the distribution of gap genes is completely different, reconstruct this entire, entire coding book, and then use the same concentrations of four, those concentrations of four genes, go into my coding my decoding book or my, my dictionary that I constructed from the wild type, look in there, where do these four concentrations are, and I should say there is a stripe or there isn't. Okay? And so the fly allows me to do that because what I can do, I have these three, these three different maternal inputs, and I can take them out one by one. 
I can take out three, I can take out two, I can take out six different sets of two, and I can take out one at a time. So I have nine different conditions that I can look at. It's no, no time. I'm just looking at one time point, at one given time point, a four-minute window. No time. Yes, exactly. Yes, exactly. Okay, so, um, and then I can go in and take a wild type measurement of these different stripes. It looks like this here. So in blue you see one, you see the mean, and in, in light blue you see different embryos. And that tells me where in my code book is the combination of genes that has a stripe. Okay? And so what that means, the, the first thing it means, of course, is I need to reconstruct um, the dictionary in my, or the, sorry, I need to reconstruct the distributions in the mutant backgrounds. And for this, you basically have here, you have these different conditions. In fact, it's only seven. So in this case, you take out one at a time. In this case, you take out two at a time. In this case, you take out all three. You see they're all flat. So there should be very little information in this system. And here and here, you see again the wild type, the movie that you have already seen. Okay, so these are the gap gene expression levels in mutant backgrounds. And you see they're very different. And so these differences we can now use to test our system. And so the first thing, let's see if this one here really has no, no information. And lo and behold, it's a flat line. And the actual output in the mutant is also flat line. There's not a single Eve pattern in the mutants if you take out all three gradients that have maternal information, that have information about position. Okay, which shows you also that it's that those are the, the ones that you need. Because if you take them out, you have nothing left. Now let's look at an example where we just take out one. Okay? I take out one of those maternal inputs. And you see that the differences in this one, in this case I take out one that's called torso, it doesn't really matter what it, what it, what it is. Um, but you see that the distributions are slightly different. They're subtly different, but they're slightly different. So for instance, this red bump is completely gone. This bump here has shifted to the left. These guys have shifted to the right. Yeah. So there are subtle differences. And now to look at the decoding map of this guy, you see that there's still lots of regions where it is following the diagonal, but towards the edges, it deviates. And if I now take my wild type measurement, I would predict to have no stripe 7 here. And these six stripes, I would predict at these locations. And if you look, you see that indeed you have stripes in these locations. And What's really remarkable here is that you, you know, we, it's a very subtle effect, right? The deviation here is maybe a percent or so, but we get that effect correctly. I'll give you an example for gross effect. So if you take out, sorry, this works for, this, is, this was for one of those seven stripe genes and it works for all of them. Um, <clears throat> now I'll give you an example for a very gross difference. So you see that the distribution of gap genes is very different from wild type if you take out this bicoid mutant. Okay, there's, first of all, they all, they're all are seemingly halved, but then also their relative uh, concentrations are very different to each other. And now the decoding map looks like a mess. There's nothing on the diagonal, there's a little bit of schmutz around here, and there's a little bit of, you know, it's a mess. However, if you predict, again, you're dead on where your mutant patterns lie. And quite surprisingly, you also detect this guy here, which is a famous um, duplication of E-stripe 7, because this guy here, this pattern here, is a duplication of that one. 
and we also got that in our data. So not only do we get very subtle effects that have that are like one percent effects, but we also get very gross changes of you know here we predicted a change that happened at fifty percent at fifty percent different position. You are very unhappy back there. Tell me. You don't want to tell me why you're unhappy with my data? Oh, you're very happy, okay. Um, no, you were the one telling me that's impossible. <laughs> um, so, but just to summarize, so this works for, you know, I showed you two examples in detail. This works for all of them. And now you can summarize prediction versus um, actual location. And you see that they all line up very nicely on a diagonal. And the deviations are again at the order of 1% of or so. So um, I guess I stopped here. I showed you all this, but I know, I'm not going to conclude. And uh, you're not going to see anything about information. Tomorrow I show you live stuff. <laughs>